Uh, Professor Dr. Irina Shah, who is uh, uh, an infectious diseases specialist at the Kakani University Hospital here in Nairobi. Good morning, Dr. Ari. And of course, we saw you speaking about a patient that had been uh, in the ICU for two weeks and recovered, and we had the testimony of the patient. Uh, just describe to us how the situation was for you as the team of doctors at the Kakani University having to treat a patient of a condition that is very new to you. And of course, obviously, you have the knowledge of infectious diseases, but this is a new a condition. What was your experience? Um, it is a very interesting experience. I mean, like uh, we've had, I think in the country, we've had the most sickest patients have been there in our ICU. Um, we've had about four so far, um, and and I and I think it was a, it was a, it was a big challenge to see how the patients were doing. We were learning every day at a time. But in the end, the outcome was good and we're very, very happy. Mm -hmm. We were a whole team. There was the infectious disease doctors, the critical care doctors, the nurses. I think we have a very, very good team in, in the hospital. And that helped us um, with the outcome. Right. Um, and as far as uh, the symptoms, how I remember the last time we spoke on this show, you were trying to explain how you're seeing the patient's progress. What can you describe coming from mild symptoms, then it gets worse until the situation where someone needs critical care. How does that progress and how much time are we talking about? So, so usually, so, so before I start, let me say 85% of patients do not get to hospital. Mm -hmm. And out of all those that go, get to hospital, about 5% require critical care. Um, so what, when they're in hospital, we monitor their, what we call oxygen saturation, mm -hmm. which looks at the amount of oxygen in the blood. Mm -hmm. And we monitor that on a regular basis. And as we see that the oxygen saturation in the blood dropping and their requirement for oxygen, supplemental oxygen goes up, mm -hmm. that is the time we make a decision on, on intubating the patient. Mm -hmm. When we feel that supplemental oxygen will not support the ventilation. And that's the time we say now we need to intubate this patient and artificially help their breathing. Okay. And, and, and when they're on the ventilator, we monitor them on a regular basis, like we have what we call a monitor. So at any given time, we can see what their oxygen saturation is. And that helps us decide what ventilator settings we're going to put the patient on. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a very intensive, and that's why we call it intensive care unit, because it's a very intensive monitoring of the oxygen saturation, the blood pressure, the, the regular uh, blood gases, the regular bloods of the patients, the hemoglobin, the whites, the kidney function, if there's any evidence of other infections. This is a very intensive process. Um, okay, and all, all through this uh, process, if you can hear me, Dr. Ari, uh, does the patient remain conscious? So once we put a patient on a ventilator, so it, it, it's like, imagine if I was going to put something to the back of your throat, you're likely to gag. So, so to, to, to assist ventilation, we usually sedate Okay. And if needed, paralyze the patient so that the ventilator can take over the function of, of the breathing. So, so majority of the patients are sedated because otherwise they would, what we say, fight the ventilator mm. because they think there's something irritating the back of their throat. So most, uh, so majority of the patients are, are, are sedated. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, this is the very first patient to come back from the, the ICU or to survive the ICU treatment. But on, uh, on average, comparing to other countries, how much time would one require if you're in that level? How much time would you require to be under the ventilator? So, so from the studies in the West, it's about 7 to 14 days. On average, it's about 11 days that a patient does stay on a ventilator mm -hmm. if they don't have any other infections, any other bacterial infections on top of, of what they came in with. So mm -hmm. it's 11 days the average time, and that's quite a long time on a ventilator. Mm -hmm. Indeed it is. And uh, when you are speaking about uh, the health workers that are taking care of such a patient, talking of the nurses and the doctors, how much of precaution uh, do they have to take? Is it um, heightened at this level, at the ICU level, or is it uh, far reduced because the patient is immobile? So, so I think it's it's a lot more. We call it we call it enhanced PPE. Mm -hmm. um, they wear they wear um, not just the N95 mask. They wear the face shield. They, literally, it's the full space suit, because the procedures that we do on these patients who are ventilated, the doctor is actually going in into their throat, right, when they're intubating the patient. So you've mm -hmm. got to be very careful that that high concentrate of uh, concentration of virus. Mm. does not you, you don't breathe it in so you, it, 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 it's it's enhanced ppe and and that has to be available in every icu to adequately care for these patients and, and it's not just for the doctors it's also for the nurses for the cleaners for anybody who enters the room the people who the phlebotomists to go to draw blood everybody is dressed like that 
Okay, and how much of this equipment do you need, bearing in mind that uh, they, you might be having different patients? So is it a different kit for every other patient? And how regulated do you have to change it? So cur currently, we, we're changing it for every single patient because we don't have that many ICU patients with mm. COVID. So with every mm. patient, we're changing it. But if I look at the mature epidemics in the West where the whole ICU is just COVID patients, mm -hmm. then you go in, you go in with the space suit and you change things like gloves uh, um, between patients and, and the apron. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to change the whole body suit. So there's different protocols depending on how mature the epidemic is and how many patients in the ward. So if you have a ward full of patients, you can go in with, with one set of space suits and come out of the ward with okay. the space suit. Because okay. changing this PPE, let me just say, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes. It's very time consuming. Uh -huh. Wearing the space suit and taking it off. And so when you have, um, I don't know how many patients you have now in your ICU facility, but uh, in a case when you had the patients that, that survived this, um, so do they have to change the gear every time they step out of the, um, of the ICU facility? Correct. Correct. And, in fact, mm -hmm. and use a different kit when they come back again? Or so, can so everybody goes in with one, every time you go in, you, you dawn, we call it dawning, uh -huh. you put in the full space suit, mm -hmm. you do whatever you have to do with the patient, give them the medication, check them out, and when you come out, you remove it and you discard it. It doesn't wow. go, it doesn't go beyond, beyond the ICU, and in our ICU, we have what we call an antechamber. So from mm -hmm. the ICU, you go into an antechamber, and then you go into the patient's room. Mm -hmm. And all this is done in the antechamber, so there is no mixing of, of, of the person wearing this gear and any other person in the ICU, any other medical person or any other patient, because we need to protect everyone else working in the ICU and every right. other patient in the ICU. And how is the cost like? I don't know whether this, this is information or do you want to disclose and who bears the cost at the end of the day? Yeah, so, I, so I, I, to be honest, I don't know the exact cost, but, uh, but often it, 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 it is the patient. I think this, during pandemics, I believe the government should be bearing the cost, if, I, if I'm allowed to say that. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, so let's talk about um, caring for a, a patient who is in critical care. In your estimation, how many health personnel, healthcare workers would you need so that you efficiently run uh, that ICU bed? Oh, it, 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 it's a lot. So imagine you have uh, a nurse cannot nurse this patient more than eight hours. It's very intensive. Mm -hmm. So in any one 24 hours, you will need three nurses. Then you have, the, you have the infectious disease doctor. I have a team of doctors that work with me and they do all the hard work. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, uh, there's a whole cadre from the, from the intern to the resident to the fellow because we're also a training institution. Mm -hmm. I can't work 24 seven. So I have a team of four consultants. We all work together. Then in the critical care unit, we also have four consultants who work like do do their shifts. So it's it's a very intensive, labor intensive environment mm -hmm. um, for these patients. Um, and 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 as the, as the epidemic matures, from what we've seen in other countries, every doctor ends up treating a COVID patient with whatever capacity they have. Right. And then you have infectious disease and the critical care team providing oversight. Mm -hmm. And do you think, having been a specialist in the infectious diseases, do you think it uh, puts you at a, a better place uh, compared to other doctors who in the fullness of time may be required to take care of uh, patients like you do? Sorry, just repeat that again. I'm asking, do you think that being a specialist in the infectious diseases gives you an upper hand in addressing uh, the needs of patients, uh, especially in the critical care, compared to other doctors who may not be specialists in that area and may be called upon to take care of them in future? So I'm, so I'm an infectious disease specialist. We also have critical care specialists and mm -hmm. we work hand in hand in managing the patient. Even the patient that walked home, I think we all worked together. Okay. Critical care doctors help manage the ventilator, the critical dialysis. They, so there are lots of things they help us do. So we have to work hand in hand. It, it, it's very hard for just one specialty to manage this patient. Okay. And when you look at um, the needs of uh, healthcare personnel that you require, and compared to the capacity we have in the country, we hear over 160 ICU beds, uh, but uh, we don't hear a lot about uh, the doctors and the um, nurses that um, every hospital, every county has, what would be your word uh, uh, assessing the situation you have in the country? 
So, so, I, so, I, so I agree, and I think a lot of the specialists are are concentrated in in the in the big towns, Nairobi and Mombasa. Mm. I, I think we need to do a lot more training. I think, and we're already doing that as different forums, the KAP, the KMA. They're all doing lots of trainings. I mean, we, we have to do with work with what we have, and we have to work best with what we have. So we we manage the trainings. We try and say that we're available if anybody needs to reach out to us. A lot of counties have reached out to us to discuss our experiences. We're doing a lot of Zoom calls where we discuss how we've managed patients. Of course, we're all learning, not just in Kenya, all over the world, right. on how the best way to manage these patients. Mm-hmm. So we're sharing our knowledge, um, writing it up, uh, discussing with CMEs that this is this is what we do. We know for these patients there is no really treat. There's no real treatment. The best thing is standard of care, and by mm-hmm. that I mean supportive care. Give put them on the ventilator, give them the IVs, give them the fluids. If they if they go into renal shutdown, give them dialysis. So it's all supportive care. If we can give them good supportive care and right. we have the institutions that can do that, the patients can do well. Okay, they, they can do it, as you say. Uh, let's talk about uh, the equipment that we have in the country and uh, we've seen innovation uh, coming up. We've seen uh, farms or factories uh, processing uh, face masks, others uh, coming up with uh, PPEs. Um, we have also seen some students at the Kenyatta University coming up with ventilators. When you look at all these, are they fit for use? And um, do you think all this innovation uh, can help us boost the capacity that we have basing on um, your experience dealing with uh, some of this equipment? So I, I, I'm really happy that we're coming up with innovations as a country. I think we should be at, at some point manufacturing all these things. I think if there's one thing we need to learn from the coronavirus epidemic is as a country, we need to go into manufacturing and not rely on other countries. Mm-hmm. Because when things like this happen, we have to have our own sources. Because if suddenly other countries said, we're not going to supply you, what will we do? We'll all struggle. So mm-hmm. that's the first thing. In terms of innovations, I haven't used them. So I think there has to be a quality against which these these masks, these uh, ventilators are measured. And if they if they measure up to these um, uh, uh, to, to these external masks and ventilators that we get, mm-hmm. why not? Um, but but that I, I'm not into quality control, and the people who are specialized in doing that, and they should do that and encourage local mm-hmm. manufacturing. Okay, and uh, Dr. Ari, as we conclude this, uh, when you look at um, the country's capacity, uh, both private and public hospitals, in your fair assessment, what do you think is the number of uh, patients that are in critical care that we can handle as uh, this moment? So like you said, we have 165 beds. I mean, in, if we don't have the, you know, it's not just about the infrastructure. We need the human resource, the human capacity. Um, so if that's the beds we have, that's the beds we have. Mm-hmm. I think we need to think, um, I think hospitals should all have a plan mm-hmm. that if I do, if we do not have isolation facilities, or if we don't have ICU beds, where are we going to refer the patients to? Right. I know I know lots of talks in government to increase ventilators, to increase the ICU capacity in the w- few weeks to come. Mm-hmm. And maybe there should be, hospitals should say that this is what we can do. If we, beyond this, this is where we're going to refer our patients. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that should be done at national, the national level should coordinate it. Um, as you know, Aga Khan Hospital has done a lot of innovation in terms of field, field hospitals to increase our bed capacities. So those are the things that the government used, need to think about. We know that there's a stadium in London that has been um, converted into a hospital because their hospitals can't cope. Right. So we really need to think of innovative ideas that this is what we're going to do. And then, and then how are we going to best use our healthcare professionals? Mm-hmm. Right now, a lot of routine medical work is not being done. Can we use these healthcare workers to assist us in the COVID response? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, even though they're not infectious disease or critical care specialists, can we do some, you know, uh, training or can we can we go to them? I mean, we've heard in other countries, retired doctors have come back to mm-hmm. work to, to to fight against COVID. So those are the measures. I think they, they have to be centralized from the government to say okay. this is where we are. This is where we're going and this is the help we need.